My name is Scott Allen, and I want to talk about JavaScript patterns for 2017. It is the end of the day. It's a small room. We're kind of friends here. I'll be honest with you. This talk did not turn out the way I expected it when I started putting it together. <laughs> if, you, if you came expecting like design patterns from the Gang of Four, that's not really what we're going to talk about. Well, what I wanted to talk about was patterns that I see in the JavaScript language, particularly patterns that have disappeared from the old way of doing things and new patterns that have emerged. And it's not just design, classical design patterns. It's more like patterns in the tooling, patterns in, in the build process, yeah, some patterns in the code. Also, things to be wary of when you write JavaScript code, things that people try to commonly do and f fail at because uh, they didn't quite understand how a particular feature worked. I hope to get you through all of that. And I did just want to take a quick poll of the audience, if I can see everyone through the headlights here. <laughs> how many people are using TypeScript today? Oh, quite a few. So at least version two, I'm guessing, TypeScript. And how many people are using ECMAScript 2015 features, like import, export, class definitions? OK. Well, I hope everyone gets something out of this talk. I basically broke things down into a few different areas. Number one, modules. When the ECMAScript 2015 specification came out, yes, there was a lot of excitement about error functions, class definitions, but it was really modules and the ECMAScript 2015 module definition that has, that has the most significant impact on our code and our architecture and how we build large applications. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about modules. I also want to talk a little bit about language features and show you some things to be aware of, talk a little bit about the current tooling system in the JavaScript ecosystem, and everyone needs a build process for JavaScript these days. So I'll give you some of the tips that I've learned over the past few years trying to build TypeScript and ECMAScript 2015 code. So first of all, let's talk about ES modules. When I saw the specification for ES modules, I remember completely underappreciating the impact that modules would have on building JavaScript code. So the first thing that happens, first thing that happens is a lot of old patterns fall away. There's actually two patterns here in this little code snippet. One is the immediately invoked function expression, and we've been a lot of us have been trained over the years to wrap all of our JavaScript code inside of an iffy so that nothing escapes accidentally into the um, window object or the global scope. Right? And the second thing we were taught was to start using the string literal use strict to switch the JavaScript runtime into the strict mode, which can reduce the number of strange errors that you get and the amount of strange behavior that JavaScript has and sometimes even lead to performance boost. Those things are all gone. Because when you write a ECMAScript 2015 module, you're using import and export keywords. You're using something like the TypeScript compiler and, and Webpack to build everything together. When you're in a, in a JavaScript file, you don't think of it as a file anymore. Every time you create a .js or a .ts file, that is a module in JavaScript. And you don't need any sort of iffy. Nothing's going to go into the global scope unless you explicitly try to put it there by going to the window object. And you don't need this use strict declaration anymore because modules by default, they will be interpreted and executed as in strict mode. So forget all the old things you know about modules and concentrate on what modules give you. And I'll just give a brief overview for those of you that haven't worked with ECMAScript 2015 modules, which you can write from TypeScript also. TypeScript used to have this namespacing thing, but these modules are even better. So inside of this file, as a .js file. It is now a module. This function work? Unless I explicitly write an export statement saying that I want to export that to other people, then that is hidden. It's an implementation detail of this file. No one will be able to access that symbol and invoke that function. But down here at the bottom of the file, I've said I want to export two symbols, work and person. So you can export functions. You can export classes. You can export variables. And you can also have a default export which just means when someone imports it, they don't need to use the curly braces to bind against that export. They just say export, or sorry, import foo from bar, and they will get whatever the default export is. We'll talk a little more about that in some more detail in just a bit. So I can import person and animal from lib, and you'll notice I'm specifying a relative path, so if you do dot slash, then what the module bundler should do whatever tool you're using, which in the future might be the native 
browser or the Node.js, but no one actually supports loading modules just yet. We have to use tools to do it. That'll go, that should go off searching for a lib.js or a lib.ts file. I don't specify the file extension. This is grabbing a default export. So this particular file, this module, slash lib slash human, should have an export default of some symbol. And then this syntax is basically a way of saying, give me everything that this library exports and attach it to this object lib. And it's not, well, yes. I don't want to call it a variable. We'll talk about exactly what that is in just a bit. But now to access things inside a library, I have to say lib.person, lib.animal. They'll all be available. It's almost functions like a namespace. So a couple things to note about this when you're using modules also that people run into trouble with. One is that the import statement creates what we call an immutable binding. So it's not really a variable back here if I say uh, import person from lib. This is a binding. So even though you can use person like a variable throughout the rest of this module, uh, you'll, you might run into unexpected behavior. So here's an example. I'm going to have a module that exports a counter, just exports basically the value zero. And I'll export a function that someone can invoke from this module called increment that will increment the counter. So in some other module, I will import counter, and I'll try to modify it. That should produce a runtime syntax error telling you that you are not allowed to do that. Counter is an immutable binding. I cannot change the value that is in that binding. I can, however, import the increment function and call something in that module to change the counter value, and that will work. So <clears throat> the counter value will start at, start at zero. I'll call increment. If we look at counter again, it will have a value of one. And this is important to understand that from a design pattern point of view, if you want to create a singleton, everyone who imports this counter is going to see the same value. And that value is live for everyone. So I could import counter into three different other modules. They're all going to see the value zero until I increment, and that value changes inside of there. So it's almost like a, a layer of indirection in these bindings. <clears throat> and yes, these bindings are live. So let's export using an object literal syntax, an object that has the name Oscar. Let's export a function that'll just say, basically, what name do you see inside the module? And then export a function reset, which will change the entire object reference that we're exporting, the entire creature. So if we start off things and I import, so pretend there's an import statement here. <laughs> in another module. If I try to assign to the name property of creature a new value, that works. So that part of the binding is not, if I try to change creature, that's a syntax error. If I try to change a property on creature, that's okay. So I've just changed the name and everyone's gonna see that name. I'll see the name in this module. If I ask the module itself to inspect that value, that will also show Winnie. And if I do a reset, everyone will see a new creature object there with a different name. Is that making some sense? And here's what I think is interesting with modules. So the kind of talking about patterns, the kind of pattern I like to see. So let's say you're building a library, and you're going to have a routing module, and a logging module, and an HTTP module. Sound familiar? <laughs> and you're going to have an application depend on that library. And that application can also use modules, routes, the shell, the components that you have. And of course, both of these pieces are going to depend on additional implementation details. So for example, the library on the left will depend on the HTTP module might depend on something that specifically knows how to instantiate an XML HTTP request to make a request versus another module that might use the fetch. So what's interesting is since, <clears throat> let's say the, the, the fetch implementation of HTTP is in this module, someone will have to export symbols from this module to make them available to H uh, excuse me, HTTP. Just like in my components, I'm going to need to export things to be able to get to the functionality that I want. And it's fine if my components, my application, reference this HTTP module. Unfortunately, it's also possible to get a reference into some of these implementation details, like an XML HTTP request, because it it's just exported. 
and anyone can walk up, and as long as they know where that is on the file system, they'll be able to get to the XML HD request, which is, I, I don't think, such a good thing. Typically, what I like to do, though, is make sure that there's some well-defined boundary where my application will export things and where I will only allow, say, my application to drill into one level of the library, if that's the way the library is implemented. And one way to do that is to have files that use this export star syntax, or have an index.js file that will export things from that directory, only the public things that are needed. So if you're not familiar with the index.js trick, this has to be supported by some sort of tooling. But essentially, let me back up to an import statement real quick. If I write this code import counter from .lib slash creatures, my tool can look for a creatures.js file or a creatures.ts file, or I can also configure things to look for an index.js or ts file that is in that folder, slash lib, slash creatures. And this goes back, node developers have been doing this forever. The idea is that this folder, creatures, has a whole bunch of JavaScript files in it, and it's that index.js or ts file that really contains the things that are exported from that particular folder. So there can be other implementation details inside of there that are exporting all sorts of things, but publicly, what I want you to use are just the exports from the index.js file that is in that folder. <clears throat> and if I'm just exporting everything, you can use export star syntax to say, let's just grab a bunch of stuff from all the JS files that are in this folder and push it all out as a public API. It's one way to do things. And then we're in this kind of strange situation with JavaScript. So the module syntax, that import and export stuff, has been defined by the ECMAScript 2015 standard. So the syntax is solid. That's what we're using moving forward. But there's not a, a single environment out there that natively does module loading. So there's no browsers that natively support some sort of import statement. What we have to do right now, they're working on that standard, but what we have to do right now is use a tool, like one of the ones listed here, that will go through our JavaScript source code, analyze the dependencies, the import statements, and just follow them out to find all the JS and TS files that we need for our application, and then bundle them up into a single file or multiple files. But it basically needs to resolve all of those imports so that things will work at runtime without requiring something like an import. So use an API that actually works, maybe something like require. Personally, I've evaluated Webpack and Rollup, and I used Browserify long ago, and right now I really still prefer Webpack. I think it's the tool that has the most momentum. So if you're you know, selecting a tool to bundle up your JavaScript code, I would definitely look at Webpack. I would also take a look at Rollup. Rollup was implemented because people wanted something that was a little more efficient than Webpack, it turns out when Webpack bundles up all this JavaScript code, it puts a rather large prefix and postfix around each bundle, uh, around each module, so it can be dynamically loaded. And that has some, that adds to the code size of all the JavaScript code you're shipping to the browser. Rollup's a little bit better with that. But Webpack just released version 2.2 within the last couple of days, and they promised that the next thing they're going to work on is actually optimizing the bundle sizes. So when it puts modules together, particularly modules that are commonly used together, uh, it won't have as much overhead. And the other thing that Webpack implement, implemented in version 2.2 that Rollup had before was tree shaking, which is a way to shake this tree of dependencies and actually figure out what you're using and what you're not using so things that you're not using can be thrown away. <clears throat> You'll see some interesting studies out there where people say um, this tool plus this tool plus this tool pr pr produces a JavaScript file that can be gzipped to this size. And when it's sent to the browser, it takes this long to start executing. And we also have to factor in, when you're choosing a tool that you want to use, how hard does that tool have to work to produce your bundle? You can see the closure compiler up here produces code that is very small, but it's also one of the slowest tools to use whereas the TypeScript plus Webpack combination is pretty good. It's small code, executes about the same as everyone else, and it's a lot faster than Clojure. And that's another reason why I prefer Webpack. It has a 
the ability to allow me to do hot module loading into the browser. So when I change a TS file and save it, just that little snippet of code gets transpiled and put into the browser. And I don't lose any state in the browser, it just gains, <coughs> gains the new behavior. How many people use Webpack? A few. Webpack gets easier and easier to use, and once you learn, like everything, <laughs> once you learn, learn a few of the basics, it becomes easier. Uh, you basically have to provide it a configuration that gives it a few pie key pieces of information. So one key piece of information is what files am I going to look at? So this is telling it to look for TS, TSX, for React, and JS files. Uh, I will talk about this modules directory in just a bit. You have to give it its entries. So entries would be like the module name that you want to use that where Webpack should start to analyze your dependencies. So if you have something like a main.ts file that is the entry point for your application, you would put main.ts here. Webpack would go to that file, look at the imports, uh, go out and find those other files that were imported, bring them in, look at their imports, and it just follows that tree down. So you need entry, you need output, basically what file am I building, where should I put it? So put it in some path that I've assigned to assets. You'll have plugins, what Webpack calls loaders, because Webpack by itself is only concerned about analyzing dependencies and bundling code together. When it encounters something like a TypeScript file, that TypeScript file has to get transpiled into ES6, ES5, whatever. And, what, and Webpack doesn't do that natively. Instead, there's very common plugins for Webpack. This TS loader is a loader that Webpack will call on when it sees a file with a TS or a TSX, in this case, TSX extension is loaded. It'll call on this TS loader, which calls the TypeScript compiler, and that produces the code that Webpack will use. And then there's a bunch of other plugins. I'll talk about this DLL reference plugin in just a bit. But uh, this modules directory, by the way, I love this thing. So a lot of times when you're writing your application code, I, I hate the pattern where I have import statements that do dot, 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 uh, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, and they're always moving up the directory and then coming back down somewhere to find a module. One of the thing, things you can do with modules directory is basically tell Webpack what is the entry point where I should go start searching for things? So if I have a statement like import foo from bar, what Webpack will do is first go to the slash client slash script folder and look for a bar directory with an index file or a bar.js file. It'll try to find it there. It'll try to find it in node modules. And this just, if you define module directories for the top level modules that you want people to use, there becomes a very easy pattern to, to, to spot in people's source code. If you see them using dot, dot this and dot, dot that, or trying to drill too deep into the directory layer that you've defined, then you know they're doing something wrong. They're not, they're not following the conventions and the pattern that you want to use in the application. This, by the way, also is supported by TypeScript. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, something else I believe in is having a Webpack configuration file per purpose. So the pattern that I've seen in the last couple applications I've built is there'll be a webpack.config.js that um, will build my application code. I'll have a webpack.config.vendor.js, which will build third-party code, so vendor code, things like Angular, React, whatever I'm using. And I'll have a webpack.tests, or webpack.config.tests.js, so that Webpack bundles up my tests. Which brings me to another point while I'm at it. A lot of people will use a test JavaScript test runner like Karma. Karma has a lot of plugins. You can tell Karma that you want it to run unit tests and point it to TypeScript files, but then you also have to load a plugin to Karma to say when you see a .ts file, please transpile that before you try to run the code inside. And so you have Karma transpiling your tests on the fly. I would prefer, actually, to just have Webpack do that it simplifies the configuration for Karma. You don't have to worry about it transpiling things. And I've typically found that to just to be a little more robust and to work better and maybe even be a little bit quicker. Karma, all it has to do now is sit in the background and wait for a file to change 
a JS file that's already been bundled up with all my tests produced by Webpack, which is really good at calling and getting things transpiled. And then Karma just has to execute those tests in a browser. And the one thing to remember about Webpack is I'll see this um, pattern too, where I actually write a little bit of JavaScript code to go out and find the things that I want Webpack to do. Because Webpack, this configuration file, it is executing inside of Node.js. You have access to all the NPM modules and um, programming constructs that you can use in Node. So I can go out and I can require something like a glob. And I can say, basically, I want to go out and find all my, so this is building tests. I want to find out all the files that have a .specs.ts extension. Those are my tests through all the folders that are in my project and just bundle them all up. And I'll have some specs over here in this other area where I keep common modules. And this crazy thing <laughs> is just trying to rewrite the file name so that if I have a file in, say, slash features, slash dashboard, slash foo, and it's bar.specs.ts, I want that rewritten in a way so that it is just, um, so I'm trying to remember what I do there <laughs> with that crazy global expression. I just want to call it uh, whatever its name is, slash script, slash TSX. Eh, it's the end of the day. I'm a little bit loopy right now. <laughs> So that's modules. Let's talk about error syntax for a second. Error syntax that was introduced in ECMAScript 2015 is this beautiful notation for writing a function that looks just like lambda expressions in C sharp. So I can write an expression where x goes to x times x, and I can invoke square now like a function. If there's two parameters, I need parentheses around the parameters. So here, x and y go to x plus y, and here's a log. Uh, well, that one's not different. I was going to say if you have zero parameters, you have to use a parentheses too. But I can invoke log, passing it the result of squaring, adding three and five. Very good. I mean, seems simple, right? And allows you to do a lot of programming with higher order functions, with ECMA, which ECMAScript and JavaScript encourage, because now I can call like the map function on an array and just pass in an arrow function and double everything in the array. I don't have to use the function keyword anymore, which is nice. But here's some patterns where I've seen people run into problem, um, problems. And I see it a lot, actually, in the React community just because of um, their particular style of programming. But one problem I've seen people run into is trying to return an object literal when they're writing an error function. Because the, what the JavaScript runtime sees here is that you're passing in a function that takes a parameter n, and it returns this expression, which is an object literal, um, or sorry, doesn't return this expression. I <laughs> got that backwards. When the JavaScript runtime sees that opening curly brace, it assumes you're not just immediately returning an expression anymore. It assumes you're running a, executing a block of code. So as soon as you put that opening curly brace there, you've defined a function that unless it has a specific return, an explicit return keyword, it doesn't return anything. So numbers.map n goes to what I thought would be an object literal, where I'm creating objects with a value property that would actually produce undefined, 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 so an array with those three values. Easy solution to that is to wrap that object literal with parentheses, and then you come out with value one, value two, value three. Those three objects. Fascinating, isn't it? Glad you stuck around for this, I hope. And here's where people run into problems with error functions. So it's supposed to be a feature of error functions, um, but it creates problems. So the idea behind, one of the, one of the special characteristics of an error function is that it can lexically bind the this reference, so I don't have to save the this reference off into a local variable and capture it in a closure. So for example, this adder object has an add method and I can tell it to add up some numbers, pass in an array, and it's going to try to use a for each statement and access this, right? You've run into the slippery this problem before, I'm, I'm sure. The value of this has changed from what it was at this point in time, right inside of where we started executing, 
and this piece of code that is inside of the function that we passed into for each. So we'll get cannot read properly sum. It's not pointing to an adder object anymore. Arrow functions solve that problem because this arrow function that's defined that I'm passing into for each, the rules of JavaScript say that this has to lexically bind, which just means in the, looking at the source code lexically, the value of this here has to be the same as the value of this just outside the arrow function. So like just when we started executing add. So that code will work fine. But this is where people run into problems. Arrow functions, you have to be careful about using too many arrows. So this is working code right here. I have a method definition on the object literal and a for each statement inside. But what if I wrote it like this? What if I wrote add as an arrow function? That means that this arrow function will capture the value of this lexically in the scope where it was defined, which is outside of adder. So it's typically whatever is the value of this is inside of a module. And inside of a module, the default value of this is undefined. So this code doesn't work. So you know, basically, look for the enclosing scope of the arrow function. If you're inside of another function, you're fine. If you're inside of an object literal, you're not in such a good shape. And then the other thing that trips people up, again, particularly React programmers who want to define arrow functions and bind them to event handlers, is that once the value of the this reference is set for an arrow function, you can't change it. It's baked in. So if I define this object adder, and I define this function called add, and then I try to bind adder to the add object literal here, to that adder object, uh, that fails. I cannot change the value of this. It doesn't work. The value of this will be lexically whatever, wherever this was defined. So it would just be out here, it would be undefined. And that's something that you have to be careful with with legacy libraries. So I, I write a lot of Jasmine unit tests. And there's this ability in a Jasmine unit test where inside of a test here, inside of a, an it, you can use the value of this to pass around some context between different tests, or between the, you know, like before each and then each individual test. And what Jasmine tries to do when it invokes this function is it tries to set up the value of this to point to the test context that it's managing, but it doesn't work because Jasmine's unable to change the value of this. So this is actually how I ran into this. I had Jasmine test failing just because I changed this from function function keyword to an error function. And that can happen with things too, like jQuery. Um, jQuery, I'm trying to go out to a button, hook up a click event handler, defining it with an error function and saying this.name, because if I wrote that as a regular function, it would work, because when jQuery invokes this callback, it sets up this pointer to point to the DOM element. But as an error function, it doesn't work. And the value will be whatever function I'm inside of, or at module scope, it would be undefined. There's new keywords to declare variables. And as of ECMAScript 2015, and one of the patterns I see out there that I kind of like and that I've been using is that use the const keyword instead of the let keyword wherever you can. Um, constant means no one else can assign to that variable. They cannot overwrite the value. So if I try x equals 3 on a const x, that should be a type error at runtime. That doesn't mean that I cannot modify, again, the object that I'm pointing to. So I can modify this array and push new values into it. It just means that no one can walk up and say numbers equals in some other array. <clears throat> if that's something I wanted to do, there's an object.freeze API to freeze numbers. And there's libraries like immutable.js that will give you immutable data structures. I would look at that. Something else. So Another, pattern, oh, another set of patterns that has completely fallen away when you start writing ECMAScript 2015 or TypeScript is that you don't never write another um, constructor function and prototype. Uh, ECMAScript 2015 introduced classes, and we say that classes are just syntactic sugar for what happens behind the scenes, which is here's a constructor function that someone uses the new keyword on. This is setting up the prototype for objects that were, will be instantiated from employees to make sure they have do work methods. And that's a useful mental model to have about classes that they map from this syntax to this syntax. But there's a couple patterns that you might have used 
with constructor functions that don't work with classes. For example, hoisting. You might want to write a utility class of some sort in a module and push it down at the end of the file because it's not important. It's not the thing you're exporting. You just want to use it from the top of the file. And you would think that would work. I mean, it works with functions. I can say const d equals new employee and define the employee constructor function later at the bottom of the file, and that just works because JavaScript essentially uh, hoists that definition up to the top of the file and things work. It does not work with classes. If I try that same code with a class definition at the bottom, that will be a runtime reference error, which is interesting. And you say, well, why is that? And you'll get even more confused when you go into the ECMAScript 2015 specification and you, and you realize that they say um, classes and functions are both hoisted. <laughs> and the function hoisting allows this to work, but for some reason the class hoisting doesn't work. And that's because of this other thing that you'll find in the ECMAScript specification called the temporal dead zone. Anyone here of the temporal dead zone? <laughs> the TDZ, sounds like a bad movie. The temporal dead zone is what the ECMAScript 2015 specification declares as the area where a symbol is available because it's been hoisted. So like a class definition at the bottom of the file, it's there, it's been hoisted. But until it's been formally declared, it's in the temporal dead zone, and any attempt to actually try to access it will produce a reference error. The same thing actually happens with let. So let x equals 2, this x, technically it's hoisted to the top of the function. It's available up here. But if I touch it or try to do anything with it, I'll get a reference error. And that's just particular. That, that wouldn't happen with var. Vars are hoisted, and there's no TDZ. But uh, anything declared with let or const or class definition, you would run into that problem. Another problem I see people run into a pattern, again, trying to push the pattern aspects of this talk, <laughs> is people do a lot of reflection in JavaScript. I want to walk up to an object and see what's inside of it. And it works a little bit differently if you define a constructor function and a prototype. If I do a for in loop over a new instance of human, I will get back the do work function that was defined in the prototype. So I could see, ah, oh, yes, this object has that capability. But if I tried to do that same thing with a class definition, it wouldn't work. Just when, class, when a class is instantiated, it takes some extra steps when it's uh, adding those methods into the prototype so that they are not seen in a Fourier loop. So you might be wondering, well, I really want to do see what is in this class. What do I do? What do I do? You could do this. You could say, I want to get the prototype of this object that I have. And then once I have that, I can use object.get own property names on that prototype object to find out exactly what is inside of a horse. And that will actually not only tell me about do work, it'll tell me about a constructor that is available for a horse because it's a class. Another pattern that you might have seen in regular JavaScript is when people implement a constructor function, they'll use instance of checks inside of the constructor function to make sure that someone invoked that function using the new keyword. And if they didn't, because it's not an instance of that function, uh, they'll turn around and use new and call the function again. You don't have to do that with classes. If I have a horse class defined and someone just tries to invoke that constructor function that's it's there behind the scenes for a class. That'll be a runtime type error. So you don't need to do any crazy checks on that. But interestingly enough, <laughs> if you're in a situation where you might want to mock something out or fake something out, and you want to walk up to an existing class definition and um, rewrite the constructor, you can actually return anything from a constructor. It's not like C Sharp where I say new horse and I always get back a horse. I could say new horse here and just get back an object with a name property, Jiffy. JavaScript. <clears throat> um, so here's something to think about. Using new features of the ECMAScript language. So ECMAScript didn't change for this 10 year period because of political infighting where the parties fell apart and they ditched version four of the standard and it took forever to get back on track and we finally got ECMAScript 2015, and now there's a new ECMAScript specification every year. Did you know that? 
There, there was a 2015, there was a 2016, which didn't include really anything new, but there's a 2017 specification coming now. And so you might want to say to yourself, how aggressively should I adopt features? And it depends on the application and the team, <clears throat> but I see a lot of people aggressively adopting features in some circles, like in the React circles, they're aggressively adopting new features of ECMAScript, features that are, haven't even reached the standard yet. And one of the popular transpilers out there, Babel, there's plugins available for it that allows you to configure just what Babel knows how to compile. How, how, you know, should it transpile stuff from just ECMAScript 2015 or also 2016 and 2017? So I can go into my Babel configuration and npm install Babel plus ES 2015 plus ES 2016. If I just want all the current standards, I can just say npm install the latest plugin for Babel. There's a plugin for React. And then there's these, these stages over here which are interesting. So the, <clears throat> the ECMAScript specification, the way, the way they work, <clears throat> the recommendations all go through this stage process where stage zero is basically like, okay, someone on the committee had an idea at the bar and they're gonna propose this new feature. By the time it reaches stage one, it's a little more serious. People have prototyped this out. They've hopefully uh, worked out some of the bugs and the impl implications for the runtime. Um, by stage two, there's probably some people that have implemented this in a runtime somewhere. And by stage three, you might even have browser vendors already adopting this new feature of ECMAScript before it's officially in the spec. And the, then there's a stage four, which is essentially it's, it's ready to go. It's just waiting for the next specification to be released. And you can go into Babel and you can say, okay, I want stage three features because I want stuff that's almost there. It looks so good, I just want to use it. <clears throat> this to me is always interesting. Um, <laughs> TypeScript is a lot less aggressive on implementing some of these features. Some things they go for like async await before it was actually ready from the specification, but um, Babel, you can get really far ahead of yourself, and some of these new features are quite good. Some of them I worry about, and sometimes I worry that something will change in a late stage and, and break existing code. But I, I did just want to cover one crazy operator that's being, that is currently in stage three and quite useful. It's the object spread operator, um, but sometimes it leads to crazy looking code. So <clears throat> this is not new. This is the bang, bang, you're a Boolean. So I want to take value and basically coerce it into a true Boolean value and get back a true or false. So a value of one, this should be a result of true, a true Boolean, a true Boolean val value of true. <laughs> and we're going to combine that with something called the spread operator. So the spread operator in ECMAScript 2015 allowed you to do things like take an array and spread it into a new array. So result would be an array with one, two, three, four, five, six. And people looked at that and said, you know, that's, that's nice to have with arrays, but what I would really like is to be able to spread an object into another object. In other words, if I have this object data with x1, y2, I'm going to create this new object result that will have name x and y. In other words, take that data object and spread its properties into result. And this is another one of those things that's quite useful in React when you're using something like Redux and you're always creating uh, new instances of objects to represent your new state, but you need to copy some things over from old objects. And in fact, in the Redux library, there's this construct, <laughs> dot, 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 bang, bang, ternary expression. And you look at that and you have to figure out what it does. <laughs> and what it's doing, you, I mean, the, one of the first things you have to figure out is operator precedence, obviously. I mean, what, what order is this expression going to be evaluated in? So once you find out that um, the negation operator will be evaluated first, you'll realize, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn data into a Boolean, true or false. And then the next thing that is evaluated is the ternary expression. So if data is true, we're gonna take the data object and spread it into this thing. If bang, bang data returns false, we're going to take this object literal over here, default true, and spread that one into result. So I want to spread one of those two things into result, but if you haven't given me data, I'll spread a default in there. JavaScript. <laughs> Async await, wonderful feature. I just started using it a few weeks ago, and I much, I much, I, I like this feature, but almost immediately the team ran into a couple problems. So async await is behind the scenes, 
is all promise-based. When I have a function declaration, get match set, that is an async function, that means that that function has to return a promise. And when a transpiler like Babel or TypeScript comes across this, it will make sure that get match set returns a promise because it, it'll create one immediately and then resolve it if I return result.data and reject it if an, if an exception comes out of here. So it works very similar to C Sharp, but C Sharp, of course, is a task of T. Here behind the scenes, the mechanism to control this is a promise, JavaScript promise. And here I can await something that returns a promise, any promise. It doesn't have to be a library that was implemented with async await. It just has to be a library like jQuery, Angular, all sorts of libraries out there use promises for different things. So this is a HTTP communication library called Axios, and I can say axios.git, and it returns a promise. Because of that, I can await it, and I'll get the result of the successful resolution here inside my result variable. Um, the trick here is there's nothing in JavaScript that forces you <clears throat> or will be aware that you might have forgot the await keyword and that when you return result.data, um, you're really returning the, uh, you're trying to get the data property of the promise that was returned from axios.get. So that's one of the issues that comes up with this. But this is how I could use it. Uh, I could have a load method that's also async and say, I want to go out and await my API getting golfers, await my API getting something else, and then do some work with that data that has come back. And that's just waiting for promises to resolve. How many people think that would be in serial, like one at a time? We'll, we'll get the active golfers and wait for that response to come back before we go to get match set. Anyone think that? Yeah. How many people think it would be in parallel? Nobody, okay, well. <laughs> this is what happened one at a time. We're awaiting that promise to resolve, and we're not going to go any further in this function until that promise returns and we have some golfers, and then we'll go out and get the match set. So how would you make this work uh, in parallel? There's a couple ways to do it, but basically you cannot use an await until after you've called these two methods, get active golfers, get match set. And one way you could do it is just to use the built-in promise methods that are available, like promise.all. Promise.all, you pass it an array of promises. It will wait for them all to resolve successfully and then give you the result back in an array, which will just destructure here into two variables, golfers and match set. And again, it's a good demonstration of I can await any promise, even a promise that I create. It's no problem. TypeScript. <clears throat> I'll be honest. I. Uh, avoided TypeScript for the longest time. <laughs> I thought it had some wonderful features, but I, it just didn't work the way that I wanted it to. It seemed like it was always just not quite up to par for, with what I wanted it to do. But I think Angular has been very good for TypeScript. I think the TypeScript team actually recognizes the problems that JavaScript programmers want to solve and how the tools work and how the ecosystem works. And I just wanted to point out a few things about this tsconfig.json file that um, TypeScript uses to figure out you know, how it's going to behave. So first is the no implicit any. That's been around forever, but that's basically the trigger that says, are you all in with TypeScript or are you not? And if I set that to false, I can have any types just floating around anywhere, and I don't have to worry about typing as much, as many interface definitions and things like that for TypeScript. <clears throat> I liked that they started embracing things like working with the Angular team and also working with React. It's a real pleasure to write .tsx files and write JSX components with TypeScript behind the scenes. Here's a big one that arrived, module resolution node. It's really nice that I can just say npm install some library. And maybe that library already has TypeScript definition files like Angular 2 would. And then I can just start writing .ts files in my own project and say import this and import that. And TypeScript automatically, because of this module resolution setting, will say, yeah, I'll go into the node modules directory and look for those things. Requires, requires no additional setup, which is nice. I like the paths setting. So you might remember earlier when we talked about Webpack, and this was new in version two, I think, two or 2.1, I don't remember. Earlier in Webpack, I gave Webpack some paths to look for modules. Here I'm doing the same thing with TypeScript. If someone says that they need to import foo from bar, um, go out and look in the client slash script slash 
bar.js. Look for that file or the bar directory. That's really nice. So it understands my layout and it even understands my environment. So one of the things I would struggle with with TypeScript is sometimes you'd pull down a library and TypeScript would complain that eh, I don't know what a promise is or I don't know what this DOM structure is that you're using. Now with this lib setting, you can explicitly tell TypeScript the type of environment that you're operating in. So I'm program programming in the browser. I'm going to tell TypeScript that the DOM APIs will be available. Don't worry about it. Don't try to uh, throw an error from trying to set inner text on such and such a thing. I'm using ES5 APIs. I'm also using ES2015 promises. They will be available, which is good. A place to call home, this would show what my usual um, directory structure would look like for certain applications where I have a services folder. In that services folder, I might have um, an API wrapper for my web API, something that handles errors, uh, something that handles parameters that come down from the web server, utils, that might be private utils. I only want to use that inside of services. So that's where inside of index.ts, that, that's where I would carefully go through and just export the things that I want to export from services so that somewhere else in my application I can just say import API, uh, import API from services. I don't have to say import API from services slash API, just from services. I want that, just that top level. And I usually, for ASP.NET Core projects anyway, I keep my uncompiled sources completely separate from the compiled sources. I, in ASP.NET Core, I treat the www root folder as like the bin directory. So the only thing you'll find in there are the processed JavaScript files that have gone through the transpilation, they've gone through a webpack. How many people use um, the types repository now with TypeScript? So this is, this is also the best thing ever. So originally with TypeScript, we needed declaration files for things like jQuery and all these other libraries that weren't authored in TypeScript. So they created the definitely, definitely typed repository, which gave you a place to go out and download declaration files for things like jQuery. And then eventually there came the tool, the TSD, TSD tool, TypeScript definition tool, where you could say TSD install jQuery and it would go out and fetch the thing from the repository. And then came the typings tool and the typings.json file or you could say typings install jQuery, and it would remember that and put it in your, uh, the typings.json file. All of that is gone. Just get rid of it. Get rid of all those tools and the extra configuration files, because now all, the, all of the type declaration files for libraries and frameworks that do not provide them natively, like Angular 2 would, live in the NPM package at types, this meta package they would call it, and now if I want to, for example, install declaration files for React and Jasmine unit tests, I don't need to install any other tools. I can just say npm install at type slash Jasmine, and poof, all of a sudden I have IntelliSense for Jasmine when I'm authoring TypeScript files. No additional configuration, no additional tools needed, and it's part of my npm package.json, so when I do an NPM install, I not only get the libraries that I need, I also get all the type dec declarations that I need. So it's quite nice. Um, the one thing that does concern me about TypeScript still a little bit, they, they have to be very careful about how aggressive they are implementing new features. I ran into this thing when I was programming with React where I wanted to write a function that would do structure incoming parameters for the, the props of a React component. And it turns out that that parameter destructuring, of course, conflicts with um, TypeScript, which sees it as something different, trying to provide type annotations. And there is a way to do it. It's just a little bit cumbersome. That's unfortunate. And it, when people you know, try to propose syntax to work around this, um, you know, the TypeScript, TypeScript team says, look, we have to be careful. There might be conflict in ES7. We, we kind of have to see how the specification committee works this out. And sure, there's people from Microsoft that um, can influence the specification committee, but still one of my concerns about TypeScript is just how quickly can it evolve and adapt if the ECMAScript specification were for some reason to uh, put in a feature that conflicted with an existing TypeScript syntax, right? Yes. There was one more thing I wanted to say about TypeScript, but I don't, uh, 
Uh, I lost it. Out of my brain already. The build. So I'm a big believer. My patterns for builds are to have tools do the simplest possible thing that they can do. So Webpack is for bundling only. Karma is for running tests. I don't try to transpile things when Karma runs. I still use Gulp because you can do 99 different things with Webpacks. With Webpacks, there's plugins to copy CSS files around on the hard drive and all that stuff. But I would still prefer Webpack to just do my bundling, take these files and spit out an output somewhere. And I'll still use Gulp to do everything else. And then even when it comes to Gulp, I'm a bit of a minimalist. So <laughs> there's a plugin, Gulp-Webpack, that allows you to use Webpack inside of Gulp. But the truth is, Webpack is just an executable. So why not just require exec and just execute that command you know, by shelling out? So I want to execute Webpack when someone wants to run the gulp task js-app. So trying to keep things simple, um, not rely on additional plugins just to make things maybe with a different syntax or a little more convenient. I'm just a minimalist about it. And speaking of which, no more global tools. <laughs> there's a few tools that you have to install with NPM. There's, a, there's only a few tools that you truly have to NPM install globally with a dash G switch. An example of such a tool would be Yeoman. Yeoman is used to scaffold out a new project. Since no project currently exists, I can't have Yeoman in a project, so therefore I install it globally. But then when you look at a lot of the samples that are out there for Webpack, for example, a lot of people will say, OK, to get started with Webpack, the first thing you do is npm install webpack-g, install it globally. And I love when they throw the sudo in there, because you have to be an admin to install Webpack, which isn't true, but I digress. Uh, I will only install those tools locally. So npm install Webpack, npm install TypeScript. And then if I need to invoke those tools, if I want to make it easy and not have to drill into node modules slash dot bin to get to that tool, because that's where they will live, well, if you define scripts in your npm package.json file, when it executes the command associated with a script, it will include the node modules bin path when it's trying to find whatever you're trying to execute. So if I just have shortcuts to run Webpack and, and a shortcut to run Karma, I don't have to worry about a global installation of Webpack. It's local. So the trade-off trade there, of course, if you have 1,000 projects on your file system, you'll have 1,000 copies of Webpack, which isn't that nice. But I can tell you what, in about two weeks, there's going to be a whole lot of people that probably don't want a global Webpack install. <laughs> because now when you start um, NPM installing Webpack from scratch, you're going to get version 2, which has some configuration changes and breaking changes from version 1, which everyone's been using up to this point. So no more globals. Keep them local. This is my typical Karma configuration file. I just want to set the base path, the frameworks, the files, the reporters, the browsers. I don't want to load any plugins to do crazy things like transpilation. All that's taken care of by the other tools. This is just my test runner. It's all I want it to do. So load up my vendor file, load up all my specs and my spec files. When Webpack processed them, they bundled in my application code because, of course, my unit tests were, they were importing things from my application. And I like to keep, keep my spec files in the same folder as the component or the service or the object that they're associated with. So if I'm building something to wrap an API, I'll have api.ts and api.specs.ts. And specs will allow me to identify that that is the unit test file to execute. And slightly controversial, um, so you don't have to really pay attention to the code here. I like using Jasmine, and I, I don't like mocking frameworks at all. <laughs> I try to write actually more integration tests these days. I have found that they provide the best bang for the buck. So for example, if I have a component that uses a service, and that service calls into an HTTP service, and that HTTP service calls into a logging service, whatever, I actually want to write unit tests against that component that use that entire dependency chain right up until an HTTP call is made. I do want to fake out the HTTP call, so I'll cut things off at like the data access layer in my JavaScript. But to me, a lot of the components that we write, they're, they, they are orchestrators. Their entire purpose in life is to call the right service at the right time and pass the right parameters. There's no real design issues that I need to drive out with TDD. Um, 
There's no real state inside of them that I need to assert on because they're just, they're not doing any calculations or algorithms. Not all of them are like that, but quite a few of them. And something I discovered a couple years ago with Angular is we were writing all these unit tests trying to isolate things like a controller, uh, which means we had to fake out services that were used at that level. And it turns out then that those tests weren't very robust. Things would still break in production. Um, the underlying service implementations, the real implementations could still change and people forget to update the unit test. And we switched things around and said, you know what, we're going to test the controller calling this service and that service calling that service. We don't care. We'll just stub things out of the HTTP layer. It was something like 70% less code that way. And we suddenly had a much higher success rate of catching problems before they went into production. Because now when someone changed like the, the API service that wraps HTTP, the unit test would actually fail because we weren't trying to fake out or mock anything at that point. So, slight rant there on tests, and that's pretty much all I have for you. I hope you got something out of this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. That's my email address. I always answer questions, and have a good evening. <laughs>